So I don't know about all of you, but I am kind of a simple kind of a person. I love things simple. I love when you give me the whole thing in a very simple and specific way. Like I remember when I was first learning about Christianity, someone says, you want to understand Christianity? Yes, love God and love people. It's that simple. And that is, that is Christianity. Do you love God and do you love people? Because isn't it true that what goes on in life is that we take these simple things and we make them complicated over time and then we don't know what the simple things are. So I'm always looking for like these little like little takeaways, little portable ways to live my life. So I'm always looking for them. I remember when I was learning how to play the upright bass and I, I was talking with a guy who was a professional player. He's like, if you want to be a good upright bass player, I'm like, yeah. He's like, play in tune and play in time and you'll do great. Pretty simple, because you know an upright bass doesn't have frets on it, right? So it's the notes, it's all by hand position in your ear. And so without a fret on it, you have to make sure if you think you're playing a C, it actually actually be a C and not a little bit sharp or flat from a C. So you have to play in tune, and if you play in time or in tempo, it works. And I always remember that as a bass player. If I play in tune and in time, I'm doing good. If you play in tune and out of time, you're not a good bass player. You play... Uh, out of tune and in time, you're really not that good. But you get those two things. So I'm always grabbing those things. I've been reading about nutrition lately. Don't recommend it. <laughs> because there's a lot of information out there, and I'm kind of horrified because nobody thinks that Twinkies are healthy. I can't fathom this. <laughs> I'm waiting for the research to get like along with what's really going on. But I was, I was reading about, uh, uh, some books by this guy named Michael Polian who as a New York Times bestselling author and, uh, th- for three books. And he had this little thing about like your food choices. And he put it this way, that if you want to uh, take care of your nutrition, you should eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Which was a really fascinating thing because even like the first one, eat food, he, the way he explains it is he says that food is not food-like substances, which I think he put Twinkie in the food-like substances category. You know, it's like things that look like food, but they're really not food. They're not natural acting food. They're uh, designed in a plant, you know? And so you eat food and then not too much, so portion control, and mostly plants. So it doesn't say you should only eat plants, which I'm super grateful he went there. But, but the idea is like, and, and I love that because it's a little portable thing where I can take it into my day and say, how should I eat? Well, I should eat food, if you include Twinkies, not too much. And mostly plants, you know, and I, I love those type of things. And I'm always looking for those things in life, right? These little portable things. Now, I remember when I started reading the Bible, I started to ask myself, well, you know, I know Christianity is about loving God and loving people, but what's like the big Bible story? Like, what's the whole story of the Bible in a compact way? And theologians say that it's creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, I want you guys to all write those down. Super good. You'll impress your friends. Creation. Fall, redemption, sorry, the brain just went silent, and then restoration. So the idea is that from Genesis to Revelation, God is the creator God. He created everything, and then in the midst of God's good creation, the fall happened. Everything broke, right? And then because everything broke, God has this redemption plan that is all about Jesus, Jesus coming and living the perfect life and dying on the cross and being resurrected from the grave. And then ultimately, Jesus is coming back and there will be a restoration or a culmination of all things when everything gets put back together in totality. And from Genesis to Revelation, that's the story. Now, what's amazing about this is that all of us are experiencing different aspects of this great biblical story. If you're here and you're listening to this, you're part of creation. Your create, creation happened, you're part of it, you're experiencing life. You're also ex- experiencing the effects of the fall. Because anybody here want to say that everything's working the way it's supposed to be right now? Your body, your life, your five-year plan, anybody's like, it's perfect right now. You're, you, you're, you're loving politics in America, you know, you're loving all this stuff that's going on, right? And so, so the fall is everywhere. It's in every situation, But then for those of you who are here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're actually also experiencing the redemption part because you're seeing how Jesus fits in to this whole grand story by placing you in the family of God. Now, even if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, 
the fact that you're even here right now, you're also confronted with the fact of redemption, even if you choose not to believe it. Everybody knows people who have experienced redemption, but they're like, I don't necessarily know if I believe it. But I think all of us hope for this idea of restoration where everything that's broken becomes unbroken. That things end up the way that they ought to be. And biblically, that speaks of the return of Jesus. Now, that's the big story of the Bible, but the reason I bring this up is actually, this is the truth about salvation, which is what I've entitled this message. And as we've been studying in this Truth and Lies series in 2 Peter, we've been seeing Peter talk about things that are true, and then if you're with us as we went through chapter two, it was all about things that are lies. The truth about lies, the truth about false teachers, all these things. And so now as this book of 2 Peter is starting to wind to a close, now he's moving back to let's focus on truthful things. And what I'm excited about in this message is that whether you are um, a follower of Jesus or whether you're here and you're a skeptic today, there's going to be some very important things that we're all going to take away from this. There's lessons and teachings. Now, again, depending on where you're at with Jesus, how those apply to you will be unique. But I think all of us will be able to walk away from our time in God's word today and have things that you want that you're going to grapple with, which is in some ways, that's my job. My job is to say, this is what the word says. And these are some ways that we can be each begin to grapple with what's in God's word, because it applies to all of us in every way. It's just a matter of uniquely as we look at our own lives and the lives of the people around us, how does it apply to us? So in order to get at this, let's open up in your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to take verses 1 to 9. If you didn't bring your Bible with you to church today, don't worry. All the books on the seats in front of you, they're all Bibles. There's no other book there. So grab those babies. We want you to be able to read along. Of course, unless you have a smart device, and then you can just pull out that smart device and just type in 2 Peter 3 colon 1 dash... Nine, and you can get there, and it'll be perfect for you that way. If you're new to the Bible, I realize not everyone knows where everything is in the Bible, so I want to get you there. Go to the back of the book, the end of the book, right? And start turning to your left. You get the book of Revelation. It's a larger book. Then you get a series of smaller books, the book of Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, and then 2 Peter. So Jude, 3 John, 2 John are only one chapter apiece. 1 John's got five chapters, and then 2 Peter. So it's just between 1 Peter and 1 John is 2 Peter. And then, of course, chapter 3 is easy to find right after chapter 2. <laughs> I love that you guys always laugh at that. I think it's fun, you know. <laughs> what do I know? Anyway, let's jump on in. In verse 1, it says this, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, before I actually get into my first point, I want you to notice that very first word in chapter three, this word beloved. Because Peter, in writing this letter, he repeats this same word four times in the closing chapter. Now, I think it's important because one, you talk about real life, truth and lies of life, is that all of us long for love. Every single one of us, we are hardwired to want love, to also want to give love. But what goes on is that if you look at life, one of the greatest areas that we have of struggle and hurt and pain is in the area of love that is given but isn't received or not reciprocated. And so the reality of loving people, it's one of the most hurtful areas. And the reason that is, is because the only way for love to truly be fulfilling is it's the love that comes to us from God in Christ. Because it's perfect love. It's self-sacrificial love. It's love that is completely without any mixture, right? And so what happens is if you receive God's love for you in Christ, that love never fails. It never gives up. It's unbreaking. But on the horizontal level, in every interpersonal relationship, whether it's parents and kids, romantic relationships, within friendships, there's always a brokenness to that love because nobody's perfect. And so what happens is because we all long for love and we're all created to give love and receive love, and it's such a core to our identities, 
if the only love you know is the broken horizontal love of, inner, of people, life can be pretty depressing and hurtful. Because no matter how amazing your parents are, they are going to let you down at times. You might have the best friends in the world, but they're not always going to get everything right. Your spouse could be batting 800, but that 200 points of their failures hurts the most, doesn't it? But the key is, is that you and I were actually designed to free up humans to be fallen because of the finished work of Jesus and understanding God's love. And I really felt, it's funny, I didn't have any of that in my notes, but as I woke up this morning and I began seeking the Lord again, one last time for this message, I felt like I needed to put that out there because I think there's some of you right now, you are shipwrecking your interpersonal relationships because you're trying to get from humans what only God can give you. And you're putting people, you're setting them up for failure, not on purpose. You're not doing it maliciously, you, you know that you're wired, you long for love and you long to give it and receive it. But what you're doing is, is you're trying to get it from people and you can't, you can only get it from the Lord. And once you get it from the Lord, then that longing is satisfied and then you free people up to be human. Dreadfully, wonderfully, perplexingly human. And then, because what it is, is when they fail you, you realize, well, that's why Jesus came. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. So you let people off the hook for their failures. But if you are trying to get that perfect, satisfying to your desires for love from people, they're always going to let you down. And so when Peter keeps coming back to them, he's calling them beloved. He's, he's reminding them of who they really are, that they are accepted in the never stopping, unending, unconditional, without any mixture love of Christ. And I think all of us wanna see ourselves as beloved in the way that Peter's talking about it. Where we allow the love of God to so captivate our hearts that we are free now with other people to love and be loved, even if it's in a way that is not completely fulfilling because it's not possible for them or for us. Does that make sense? So we're going to get way farther than just one word, though. So he says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, verse 1, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. So what I love about this is Peter is explaining, hey, I wrote this letter just like I wrote my other letter, I want to remind you of things that you already know, the words of the prophets and the commandments of the apostles. Why? Because you and I, we need to fill up our minds with truth. You need to fill your mind with truth. Do you notice this? It's the second letter. I want to remind you. And I want to remind you of things you already know, the words of the prophets and the words of the apostles. Why? Because you and I are constantly filling up our hearts and minds with things every single day. You realize that for each day has 1,440 minutes in it. Now, if you start subtracting out time for sleeping and these things, everything else all day long, you are filling your heart and mind with stuff. And there's an old saying, garbage in, garbage out. The idea is that if whatever you put into you influences and conforms and shapes you, and whatever you put in, you are going to get out. Like, let me give you an example. Many of us understand what it's like to have anger issues, right? Anger, and, and it's always so funny when someone says, I'm not bad at you, when they're yelling at you. You know what I mean? You ever, you ever meet those type of people? I'm really not bad at you. And you're like, well, great. I'd hate to see if you were, you know? But listen, I guarantee you, someone who's angry, they're also consuming lots of angry material. Like, they're, like you can always tell when someone's watching political talk shows in the 21st century. You can tell and within two seconds. Do you know why? Because we all can agree that politics in the 21st century is like a real classy endeavor at this point, right? It's like it's so holy and, 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 and kind-hearted. No, it's, it's, it's like a steel cage wrestling match with props at this point. Right? You can always tell when someone's watching it. Why? Because 
if somebody disagrees with them, they fly off the handle with them, start yelling at them, calling them an idiot and all this stuff. Why? Because that's what they're learning watching these shows. If you, if you put your kids in front of all this violence, it's not going to be shocking when someone takes their twin, they knock them in the head. Because you're, I'm not saying they should do it. It's like, but that's what happens. Because whatever you put in, you get out. Right? And what it is, is you and I are bombarded 24 hours a day, seven days a week by the way that the world works. The values of this world. The dog-eat-dog, attack style, can't have a conversation with someone you disagree with, you hate people. We're being bombarded by this every day. And it's not just on political talk shows, it's on every single television show. And it's on your internet, and it's on your mobile phone, and it's getting pumped for you young people into your Snapchat and into your Facebook because there's a little thing on the side which is telling you this is how you're supposed to live. This is what you're supposed to value. But what Peter's saying is you need to fill your mind with what is true. Because the thing is, is so much of this is just noise. It's one person's view of the world that they want you to adopt. And they have vehicles, whether it be radio or television or your smartphone or the internet, and they can give you their worldview. And if they give it to you long enough and loud enough, you will adopt it whether you think about it or not. But Peter's saying, I wrote this letter because I want to remind you what the truth is. And my friends, this is a big concern for me as a pastor. Because you may say, well, Fusco, give me a break. I mean, I'm, I am here at church right now. Like I'm hearing the word. I'm here to tell you that a 40-minute sermon, no matter how inspired by the Spirit, how deeply biblical it is, no matter how well it is delivered, cannot counteract seven other days full of another way of thinking. It's a limitation to what I can do. You say, well, I go to Wednesday night too. Oh, I watch your two-minute message. What can two minutes do in the midst of 1,440 minutes in a day? So you see, there's, a, there's a, a dilemma that goes on for the people of God because you are being inundated every single day. You're filling your mind and your heart with all this stuff. And I'm not saying we should, you know, you, we should get rid of technology and we should go back to dial up. I'm not advocating that at all. That would be horrible. I grew up in that generation. Remember when you go on and you hear that little sound, take 97 minutes, you go to open a web cage, it takes eight minutes. So I'm like, that's still my life. Well, get a new computer. Anyway, you know. But it's like, I remember those days. I'm not saying we should go back. I'm not saying that it was better back then. But what I am saying is that if you're not filling up your mind with truth, then you're filling up your mind with lies. Like, you're, you're, you're either getting good stuff in, you're going to get good stuff out, or you're getting garbage in, and you're going to get garbage out. So, like, let me give you an example. If all you do is listen to music, and I love music, where there's a lot of expletives in it, you shouldn't be shocked when you start thinking in expletives and using them. It doesn't make a difference. Because that's what you're hearing, and that becomes normalized. If you are inundated every single day, it's like we're seeing the research now with children and violent video games. Because if, if your child is being socialized, killing other people, then if they do that long enough, then kids going in and killing people doesn't seem so horrific, even though I'm not trying to justify violence in this generation. I'm saying, but everyone's seeing the correlation between the two. And for children who maybe have mental health issues and leanings, all of a sudden these lines get blurred and they don't see that there's a moral problem with it because they've grown up watching this their whole life. So what I am saying is that you and I, we need to fill up our minds with truth, which is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. This is who God is and God, how God sees the world. And it's not enough to hear a sermon on a Sunday and you come to the midweek and you listen to Fusco's two-minute messages as much as I'm happy that you do that. You need to read the word of God every single day. You, you need to handle it every single day. I remember one of the, I remember sitting in church, just like many of you are doing right now, and I heard a pastor, and he said, you need to memorize scripture. And I thought to myself, yeah. So I started to memorize scripture, because when you memorize God's word, when you go to do something stupid, a verse pops up. Like... Because I don't know about you guys, but I got a PhD in doing stupid stuff. You know what I mean? Like, like so stuff goes on, and I need to be reminded. Like, like, let me give you an example. The Bible says that our words should be 
edifying, that we should build one another up. Now, how many of you received communication from somebody that didn't quite feel really upbuilding? Anybody? Yeah, like all of us, you know? So, but, so what happens when I go to say something that is not building up, I hear things like, let all things be done for edification. That's a Bible verse. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I better not say that. Now, I'm not saying I always get that right. <laughs> but at least I know where the lines are. But you know what the problem is? Because some of us don't know the Bible, and we don't have these verses, you say whatever you want. You just tear someone down. Or in the, the church, of course, we've mastered the art of the backhanded compliment. Where they're really just cutting you down, but they're trying to make it sound really holy. Do you guys ever hear that stuff? I'm a pastor. I get a lot of those. Where they're like, you know, Pastor Daniel, we know, but, 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 and I'm like, oh, here we go. You know? The we know is like a compliment, but it's really just a setup for the, you know? But when you know the word, the word can check you on those things. Like, like, remember I talked about using expletives. The Bible says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. So because I know that verse from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, when I go to use colorful language, I have to catch myself and say, oh, hold on. Because I grew up around Jesus' name as a filler word. That was my family I grew up in. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like you could say something, but if you said it with an expletive, now you really meant it. You know what I mean? And so I grew up in that. And I'm like, but I don't want to speak that way. Because I want blessings to come out of my mouth, not cursings. I want beautiful things to come out and not corrupt things. But I'm here to tell you, we live in a world that doesn't care about the difference. But Jesus does. So are you filling up your mind with truth? Now, I know what you're saying. I don't like to read. Well, get the thing on MP3 and they read it to you. I don't do MP3s. We'll get it on CDs, cassette tapes, or 8-track. It don't matter. Just get the stuff in you. Get it. Get God's word in you because the truth changes you. This reminds me of Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Beautiful verse, isn't it? Now, the word meditation in the Bible is different from the way meditation is used today. If you think about meditation, you think of someone sitting all like a pretzel, trying not to think, focus on your breath, Right? In Hebrew, the word meditation leads to chew on something to get all the nourishment out of it. So what he's saying is that we want to be people who chew on the word of God, keep gnawing on it, gnawing on it, to get all, all the nurture out of it. See, because we all need reminders, don't we? Because I know what happens for some Christians, like, well, I studied that book. But God's word is alive. It has new things to teach you each turn. I've taught many of these books many times because I'm teaching it to you all. And I'm learning new things every time. Like, wow, I never saw that before. Wow, and certain things apply to my heart differently than they did before because we're all in process and God's word is alive and it interacts with each one of us right where we are. And listen, we all know that we need reminders. If you don't believe me, just ask your wives. Okay, for the husbands in the room. You know that you would forget the milk if she didn't tell you 97 times, right? See, so all the guys are like this. Because you don't want to say yes because you know we'd forget, right? I, lo I love my wife. She's so patient and kind. She'll, I'll go somewhere. She'll be like, don't forget the ketchup. Don't forget the ketchup. Don't, I'm like, oh, I will forget the ketchup, you know? And, and then I get to the store. You know what the first thing I forget is? The ketchup. It's unbelievable to me. So she texts me now. I know you have the ketchup. I'm like, oh, you're so godly, you know? <laughs> and sure enough, like, I get the text. I'm like, oh, I forgot the ketchup. Darn. <laughs> and I go over to the thing. And, like, and like, I think I'm stealing the ketchup because I'm like, all, like, like trying to be all sly. Like she's watching, like <laughs> dropping it in the back of the cart. <laughs> but we all need these reminders. And I know that you know deep down you need your heart filled with truth, don't you? And your head filled with truth. Because if not, you're just filling yourself with garbage. 
It might be entertaining garbage, but it's not, it has no true eternal value. So let's fill up our minds with truth. Now from there, Peter is constantly navigating the truth and the lies of his culture and the things that were going on in the church, and we have it here. Look what it says in verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, of which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Now, what's fascinating is I think one of the things, you want the truth about the gospel and the truth about salvation, and I think something that we all struggle with is that you and I need to expect doubters we need to expect doubters. Because you know what happens for many people? You, you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and then all of a sudden people start coming at you that they don't agree with you, and they, don't, and they don't believe it, and they have these arguments, and they're very passionate about those arguments. And for a lot of people, our faith gets shipwrecked because we do not expect doubters, but we should. I remember before I got married, one of the great pieces of marital advice that I got, right before we got married, someone said to me, Daniel, expectations ruin relationships. I remember being like, hmm, never heard that before. But I started to think about it because what happens is, is that when you have an expectation, it's this is, what I, this is what I expect to get out of this situation. But the problem with your expectations is, is nobody knows that you have them. So all of a sudden, somebody is not living up to your expectations and then you're getting frustrated with them and they're letting you down, but they don't even know that they're being graded on that. And so the idea that expectations ruin relationships... The key to expectations is you share them with one. This is what my hopes and dreams are. This is what I want it to look like so that this person isn't trying to get an A, but they don't know what's on the test, right? And that's what, isn't it? How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? Everyone's like, yeah, you know? So expectations ruin relationships. In the same way, if you don't expect to have opposition to your faith, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you go out into the real world and all of a sudden your friends who are supposed to be your friends are like, I don't really like the Christian version of you. Then you start saying, well, I don't know if I like the Christian version of me either. Right? But you should expect opposition. You should expect doubt. Because in Peter's day, that was going on. He's saying, look, knowing this, that scoffers in the, will come in the last days walking not in the spirit, but in their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, what's amazing is the apostle Paul said almost the exact same thing. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Now, the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. See, what he's saying is that the, the Spirit tells Paul, and now the Spirit inspires Peter, says, look, in the last days, scoffers are going to come. People are going to cast doubt on Jesus. And in Peter's day, much like today, What's one of the reasons that people scoff? Because Jesus hasn't returned yet. You guys ever meet somebody who says, I can't believe you're a Christian. You guys believe Jesus is coming back. He's been gone for 2,000 years. How's he going to come back? Anybody ever hear that argument before? Or maybe the more popularized bumper sticker version, Jesus is coming back, look busy. It's the same. It's, it's, It's making fun of this reality that Jesus is coming back. Now, here's the thing. Since the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, we're in the last days. Like, that's what the Bible teaches. From the day Jesus ascended into heaven, 50 days after he was resurrected from the dead, that began the last days. And Jesus hasn't returned yet. But what goes on is that because Jesus hasn't returned yet, it's really hard to believe in things you haven't seen yet. But you and I know that the Bible says that's what faith is all about. Faith is about believing what has not yet transpired yet. 
Hoping is trusting God for a future that you haven't seen yet. But because you know who God is and you know how God works, you can say, I can have hope in this. See, but for a world that doesn't believe in God, it's very easy for them to scoff and make fun that Jesus hasn't returned yet. And so that was going on back in Peter's day, not 2,000 years after it happened, but maybe some 40 or 50 years after all this stuff happened. Where's his return? And what Peter does is he goes back to creation. Remember I told you that creation, fall, redemption, restoration? He goes back to creation, and he reminds them that in their questioning of their doubts about the Lord and their doubts about what he's done, he says, look, for these, verse Verse 5, for this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So he goes back to the creation account, and he reminds them that creation was made by God's word and water. Kind of crazy, right? But if you read Genesis chapter 1, what you learn is God spoke everything into existence, on the first day of creation, we learn that God created the light, right? On the second day, God created the firmament, which separated the upper waters from the lower waters. That's the second day of creation. And then on the third day of creation, the waters collected together into oceans and land mass, right? But what he's getting at here is he's saying, look, the word of God was created by God's word and water, but then God also judged the world by water, referring to the flood. Right? So what God used for creation, God also used in that case for judgment. Now, you might be saying, well, God used water. I mean, isn't that, who really believes that? You do, because how many of you guys know that your body is made up of a lot of water? You guys know that. How many, who knows what percentage of your body is made up by water? I, love, I did that first service too. I got every number between about 70% and 95%, which is a good reminder that 98.4% of statistics are made up on the spot. Just like that one. That was fun, right? But, but we all know a large percentage, some 70, 80, maybe almost 90% of your bodies is made up of water. Even you talk to the New Agers, they say one of the great life forces is water. So, so the idea is that God created the world with his word and he used water, but then he used it to judge. And then he says, which I think is very fascinating because then he moves from creation, he moves all the way to restoration in verse seven. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved. The glass is coming down. It's coming down. <laughs> Whoever gets it wins a prize. The beauty of slope floors. If there's anything left, give it back to whoever lost it. They might want it. So where was I? Oh, yes, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So now what we learn is that in creation, God's word and water were involved, and then God's word sustains creation, and that at the restoration, fire is going to be used. That God's final restorative judgment is going to involve fire. Now, what's really fascinating is if you read the book of Genesis at the flood, God created the rainbow saying, I'm never going to destroy the world by water again. So the fact that it's going to be by fire, this is gives us a very interesting piece of information about the restoration. But Peter says all, he's confronting the doubts of his day using reasoned arguments, which I think is really important. We do a lot of that here where I'm talking about, hey, you can explain it this way and this way. I'm trying to help you reason through these things because I understand the day and age we live in because I live in this day and age too. I talk to all sorts of people about Jesus and I learn all sorts of things about how people view these things and why they look at them this way. And I say, how can we understand what these things mean and how do we explain them in a way that people can understand? But Peter does that because there's something even more important that I think is very important for us to be able to, to end on here. Look at what it says in verse eight. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come 
to repentance. My friends, you want the truth about salvation? God wants everyone. That's God's desire. God's desire is for everyone to come to know him. So on the question of where's the return of the Lord, Peter gives two answers. First, he gives the answer that God's perspective and God's timing is different from ours. And he quotes Psalm 90, verse 4. First, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. In Psalm 90, verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. What that means is that from God's vantage point, time exists differently. Now, a thousand years sounds like a long time for some of us, right? I mean, even the oldest person in the room today, maybe in their 90s, we have a 94-year-old at our, at our 9 o'clock service. In God's economy, that's not even breakfast time yet. You know, so, so it seems like a long time, but for God, time is different. But then also, the other reason that Jesus hasn't returned yet is verse 9. Look what it says. The Lord is not slack or lazy concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. See, the reason Jesus hasn't returned yet is because God is patient with us because he knows that if he would have come back 20 years ago, I would have been lost. And he knows that if he would have come back two years ago, a bunch of you would have been lost. And he knows that if he comes back today, there's all sorts of people who aren't going to have an opportunity to receive Christ. And this reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, they, that the wicked turn from his way and live. Do you see that? See, God, see, this, this is important because God's heart is not in the destruction of the wicked, but God wants the wicked to turn, to repent from the way that they act and live. See, now my friends, this is so important because this verse drives who we are at crossroads. Because when it says that God is not willing that any should perish, what does any mean? Any. That all would come to repentance. What does all mean? All. Now listen. I want to talk to those of you here who are solid believers. I realize there's some of you, you've been in the Lord a long time. I would call you grounded in the word. I realize that here at Crossroads, I ask you to be inconvenienced a lot. Because there's things that we do here that you wouldn't choose. You're like, why do we have to do an altar call every day? I mean, come on. It's like, I got to go to lunch. I'm already saved. Yeah, well, you're not the only person here. Right? It's like, I ask you to be inconvenienced. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. See, you, you, want, you guys want to clap? Praise God. I have people say things to me like this. They say, they say, well, we know that you're focusing on the younger generation. Wrong. When I look at the generation that's alive today, the boomers down to the young kids, they're all lost. So, yes, I am worried about the generation that we live in from the oldest to the youngest because the majority of this generation is outside of Christ. So here's the deal. Here's what goes on. I would say 80% of churches in America exist to make you happy as a solid believer. They'll, they'll play the songs you want to hear. They'll play it at the volume you want to hear it. No one sings those songs. They're not even on the radio, but you like them and they'll sing them for you just so you stay happy. But the problem is, is the God who is patient, who's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance, is waiting for the grounded people to get off of their butts and be involved in the work of God's kingdom. So I ask you to be inconvenienced coming here because, let me give you an example. When Lynn and I, when we found out we were pregnant with Annabelle, there had been six years since our daughter Maranatha. So we have a six-year gap. We're like, okay, we're done, right? But all of a sudden we find out that we're pregnant. And you know how inconveniencing it is to have a new baby? 
It's like we gave away all the stuff already. We have no extra baby clothes. We have no locks on everything. I haven't changed a diaper in a long time. Praise God. But you have this little baby and guess what happens? You're all inconvenienced, but it's for a good reason because babies are really awesome. And their lives, and, and, and you care about them. So we went through all this stuff to make our house baby-proof again for a baby. But it was all an inconvenience, but it was worth it. See, we, the problem that we live in today is that too many of us have lost the heart of the God who is not willing that any should perish. And they're saying, well, actually, God loves me, and it's about me. And that is an American lie, not a gospel truth. See, the apostles were radically inconvenienced by the work of the kingdom. Paul going to the Gentiles got him in all sorts of trouble. See, we do so much stuff here at Crossroads because I get nervous when I watch the body of Christ because most churches exist for the solid people to feel comfortable and not to reach the lost. And for me, I can't live like that. I know how to do it. But you know what happens? You end up setting up church in a way that somebody who walks off the street who is interested, hoping that there's something to Jesus, they walk off the street and they walk into the church and they think, there's nothing for me here. This is totally weird. I don't understand what they're talking about because everything's in a language they don't understand. The whole decor looks like it's from like the 70s and it's not back in style yet. The music is not contemporary in any way. And so they say, this has nothing to do with my life. And then they go and they go to some little new agey place where everything seems to be contemporary, but they're not getting told anything that's real. And they're like, this means something to me. And they leave the body of Christ, the one opportunity, and they go and they get lost. And I'm just telling you, as a pastor, I can't live like that. So I ask you as solid believers, those of you who've been walking with Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to be inconvenienced a lot. If you don't like the lights, shut your eyes. If you don't like the songs, who cares? You're a solid believer. You can worship the other 100,000, 100, 1,420 minutes in the day, whatever songs you want. But we do this because we actually believe in the God who's not willing that any should perish. Why should the only churches that lost people go to be churches that don't teach the gospel? Because that's what you have. You either have churches for saved people, doesn't have any relevance for anybody. Then you have churches for lost people, which actually doesn't have any gospel involved in it. So at Crosses, we're saying, we're actually gonna do both. But you know what the biggest thing that breaks my heart? Amen. But you know what breaks my heart? I get in the most trouble with the saved people. Like, I don't get it. It's like, it's like, why are we here? Like, and what I realize is that everyone is so used to being saved and the, and the world that caters to them that you bring in the church. And some of you right now, you're just rating the music. You give me a music grade, you give them the sermon grade. You're like, I don't know if I like Crossroads. I think the music's too long. It's like, just bring your credit card and go to the mall. It's like, you're just a consumer. But when you are willing, when you are willing to have God's heart for the loss, you'll experience all sorts of inconvenience. You know why? Because when somebody who thought that their sin was so great that God could never forgive them when they give their hearts to Christ and they get filled with the Holy Spirit and their life gets transformed, that's why we exist. That's why we exist. But if we're not willing to be inconvenienced, that's not God's heart. It's never been his heart. I mean, talk about inconvenience. Jesus left heaven's glory and took on human skin and got nailed to a cross. That's how serious this is. And I love it. Before our, 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 our nine o'clock service, we have these pre-service prayer meetings. And some of my favorite times at Crossroads is in the before service prayer meetings where we're all laying hands on one another. And somebody prayed and said, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. 
pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his field. See, if you read that in Matthew's gospel, you know what happens right next? Jesus sends his disciples out and do by two. Because there was already laborers, they just weren't in the harvest field. So for my brothers and sisters, those of you who are in Christ, listen. You are in the harvest field everywhere you are. And God is not willing that any of your coworkers or your, or your neighbors or the people you play sports with or the people in your school, he is not willing that any would perish, but he is waiting for them to come to repentance and God wants to use you. He wants to use you in their life as somebody who invites them and says, listen, just come, just come, just join me at church. Just, have you ever checked out Jesus? But what happens is we want to be liked so much and we don't expect any sort of doubt or opposition and we've gotten scared into doing nothing. And we look at the world and we say, I don't understand why the world is like this, but the church is stuck in the building. And then every time a pastor says this, someone's like, well, that's works righteousness. No, it's not. It's called the Christian life on this side of the cross. It's called having the heart of God and thinking that they met in ISIS the reason they're like that is because they don't know Christ. And people who do all sorts of things that are all messed up, the reason they're like that is because they don't know Christ. And the reason they don't know Christ is because no one's told them. See, what we're trying to do at this place is we're trying to get God's heart right to reach a generation that's been forgotten by the church in the name of let's just make the believers happy. And I'm here to tell you, if that's what you want, pretty much 90% of the churches in America will suit you just fine. But this place never will. It won't. Because if I allow Crossroads to be a nursing home for dying saints, I've missed the calling that God has on my life. I can't do it. And what I love about you all is you all know that, don't you? So I'm not, I'm not upset with anybody. But when I read that God is not willing that any would perish, he made that truth real in his blood. Like Jesus got brutalized on a cross for that truth. And if my Jesus... And your Jesus would go to that length for redemption and restoration, then we all need to learn how to step out of the boat at some point. And so my prayer is that because God wants everyone, the junkies, the homeless people, Republicans and Democrats, (laughs) He wants people, all of them, And Jesus has not returned because God is not finished working yet. You and I need to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and in our nation and in our world. And there's no more time to wait. There's no more time. We are are in extra time. And at some point, Jesus is going to come back. And I don't want to be like, Lord, I'm sorry that there's not more people, but I just really wanted to be comfortable. I really just didn't want to be inconvenienced. When you realize that life is all inconvenience, it's just a matter if you have the right story behind it. And listen, if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus before, guess what? God wants you so bad he sent Jesus. God wants you to be part of his family so much that he had you here today to hear this message that Jesus came on a rescue mission you. If you were the only one who needed it, and believe me, you're not. If you were the only one, he would have came on the same rescue mission for you. He wants you. And he wants to love you with an everlasting love, a love that doesn't break, that doesn't give up when you have a bad day, that doesn't leave you there in your moment of weakness because they don't want to be inconvenienced by you. That's not God. It's not his heart. But you have to say yes. Like any relationship, you have to say yes to it. You have to say, okay, 
And I believe that there's many of you, you're here today, you're gonna say yes to Jesus for the very first time right here. Maybe you're on our online campus or our Southwest Portland campus, you're gonna say yes to Jesus right today. Listen, what I can tell you, if you say yes to Jesus, he will radically change your life. So shall we bow our heads and our hearts and pray?